I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello and welcome to season three of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we have Eni with us because we are going to be doing uh, every season opener with Eni to do a our favorite ghost stories, which is, seems to be everybody's favorite woot, woot. episode. Yeah. So woohoo! Also, happy New Year, happy y'all! Happy New Year! Woohoo! Yes. What what made people like want a baby as the logo or like? Well, because character old man, for- the baby actually grows to be an old man in yeah. the course of a year. Oh. So you know the baby New Year, and then you know old man, you know. Uh, Winter or whatever. Just, yeah. Old man. Which is kind of creepy. Yeah. 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 Old man. Tw- <laughs> hey, I'm getting out of here. Yes. Dropping babies from the top of New York buildings. Well, no. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> oh. This went dark is that fast. What is? Yeah, That's what I said. <laughs> no. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> we do not condone the dropping of babies. <laughs> Just not in New York. At any height. Yes. <laughs> Don't drop your babies. Well, um, enough of the baby talk, but uh, (laughs) let's go ahead and do some, uh, you know, some announcements. Uh, So bear with me here. I got a few. Uh, But for, like I said, season three, we're going to start it off every season um, from now on with Eni doing the My Favorite Ghost Stories. Also, uh, we have restructured uh, a bit. So this is going to change for uh, people who are just listening on whatever platform you're listening to that's not Patreon. So everybody who's getting free content, we are going to be uh, reducing back a little bit to just one full hour episode a week that will uh, come out on Tuesdays. And then we're going to do a mini episode every week on Saturdays. And with that, though, we are going to have a lot more fan interaction. We're going to have more guests and stuff. So they're going to be beefy episodes. Don't worry. Uh, But if you are a para junkie over on Patreon, then that means that you will have the same amount of content that you were getting before. Um, So that's three to four extra episodes. And if you are in the uh, two higher tiers, that means that you get an extra episode every month. Uh, So that's pretty cool. So if you want all the... Uh, fun extra content and extra episodes and stuff, maybe check out our Patreon. Um, also, for para junkies over on Patreon, we are going to be doing a para junkie day. Woo! Woohoo! Yeah. We have made our own holiday. Yes. Uh, so, that is going to be a live stream ghost party uh, for all para junkies, even the ones uh, who chose to just do the $3 support button. So, you will also be included on that. Uh, and we'll give you more details to that when we uh, get a little bit closer to a date that we want to do this. But just something to look forward to is you get your own holiday and things like that. So I believe that is all the announcements that I have for today's episode. Um, Also, make sure to check out our website for blog posts because JT and I have been working on writing some fun, ghostly blog posts. So if you want to read content, that is where you should go. Um, (laughs) When I was a kid, TV was called books. Yes. (laughs) I still am a bookworm, so (laughs) I am elderly, I guess, but... Anyways, uh, so let's go into our favorite ghost stories. It's been a while since we've done this. So, Eni, uh, first off, would you like to introduce yourself for people who have been, haven't <laughs> heard you at this point? So, Hi, I'm Enika Edenfield, Eni to most people, and I live here in Savannah, Georgia. been here since 2010, used to work in news uh, during the pandemic. I started sharing ghost stories on TikTok, and that kind of took off. When things started opening up, people started asking for in-person tours, and I was like, oh, I should start a business now. So I've been the proud owner and operator of Enica Enfield Tours for a little over a year now. Excellent. Yes. Very. Hey, tell us all your, your tags and your, your places oh, to yeah. be found. Uh, yes. I am on TikTok, Salt Waves, Spanish Moss. I'm on Instagram, 
Eni Edenfield. Eni is spelled E E N I E. Uh, I also have Patreon. Um, definitely, definitely check out. <laughs> no, drop your Patreon. Patreon. Drop your Patreon. Patreon. But, uh, also, I am Enika Edenfield on Patreon. Excellent. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, with that, though, um, you uh, have had lots of experiences since the last time you've done a My Favorite Ghost Stories yes. episode. So, do you have one in particular you would like to share with, with the group? <sighs> so, do you want to talk about Savannah or do you want to talk about other places? Your favorite. You know, okay. I think that what's happening is we, we've definitely broadened our scope to allow for, you know, ghost stories because there are compelling ghost stories everywhere. So, I have family that moved up to. Ohio, around the Columbus area. And there are two things that I will always drag people to if I go to visit somewhere. We're going to a cemetery, and we're going on a ghost tour. It might be me just dragging you around a haunted places right. with a book going, oh, and this ghost haunts this place. Uh, but we're doing both. And recently, I went back up to visit some family, and it was actually my sister who decided to take us on a ghost tour. And... The ghost tour guide, fantastic guy, uh, was showing us around haunted Columbus, and he stopped out in front of a where a hotel used to be, and he starts telling this story, and it started ringing some bells because it reminded me a lot of little Gracie here in Savannah. Uh, little Gracie was born and raised at the Pulaski House Hotel that used to be off of Johnson Square. She passed away really young from an illness, and she's buried out in Bonaventure Cemetery with a headstone that is her likeness. Uh, the ghost tour guide started telling us about a boy, I believe his name was Little George. Uh, and George grew up at this hotel. His parents ran it. And one day he ended up falling down the stairs, I believe, and lingered for several days until he passed away. And he's buried out at one of the larger cemeteries in Columbus. And he also has a headstone that is his likeness. And just like little Gracie, people also leave gifts there in front of his grave. In fact, uh, the... Cemetery owners, I don't know what to call them, uh, have put a sign out in front saying, please stop leaving gifts on the headstone. If you want to leave gifts for him, we have a box in the lobby of our building that you can leave the gifts in. (laughs) Because just like with little Gracie, they had a problem with people touching the Mm -hmm. headstone and doing damage to it. Um, But a lot of people in Columbus report seeing little George Uh, running around where that hotel used to be. And some people say that they will see him cross the street over to where there's an old theater now. Uh, But it was just really interesting. Like the once he started telling the story, I'm like, this is really weird because a lot of it matches up with Gracie here. And I looked it up and this is an actual kid. It wasn't something that he made up. Uh, So it's really interesting that two different parts of the country, two different children, um, but they're weird similarities in their lives and in their subsequent hauntings. Yeah, that's really cool. And yeah, you know, to have so many startling similarities is is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So for um, some of our viewers who are um, from Ohio, because I know we have a few, there you go. You should go visit little George because... There you go. So did you look up um, if he died like after little Gracie or if... I don't remember. I know it was around the same time period. Sure. Uh, Little Gracie died in 1889. Little George would died somewhere... Uh, at the end of the 1800s or early 1900s. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because m- my theory, it was like maybe, you know, he died and his family had visited Savannah at some por- point and maybe <laughs> saw Gracie Watkins is like... Well, um, there's a familiarity to that ghost story anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, especially the concept of children ghosts. Children are per- persistent ghosts. Like when a, when a child dies, and, and, and my theory is basically we grow up... And as we mature, we are told all these things about death. We're given rituals about death. We, we, we're explained things about death. And we come to some idea of what happens when you die because that's what mortality is, one long musing about death. A child does not have that. So when a child dies, it doesn't register as death. It registers as 
more life, just different. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, oh, I can walk through a wall. That's fun. You know, all of a sudden, I'm playing a a long game of hide and seek. You know, and and so children ghosts are oftentimes the most uh, interactive. They are the most physical. You know, they can touch, pull, get your attention. Uh, And I think that that is something that across the board becomes. And so when you talk about a hospitality place, a place where children are so geared towards greeting people, you know, not being afraid of strangers, being very outgoing, you know, most hotel children understand transients, understand people coming and going. So they are, you know, Gracie is said to be seen waving to people as they drive by the square. Mm -hmm. And that kind of thing, I think, is, you know, not typical of the period. When you think of children, uh, there's been a longstanding scene not heard, Mm -hmm. you know, never interrupt. But in a hospitality place, the child is, you know, quick to say hi to people and quick to, to, to be involved in people. So yeah, I, I think that, uh, that the fact that their life story is so similar makes sense that their ghost story would be so similar. Right. Well, and it's a weird concept in general to make a headstone look like the person who it's Mm -hmm. like, you know, who died because it's like, it almost feels that they're trying to keep that, that person there. Oh yeah. Because Absolutely. you know, when it's your likeness, I mean, that has an essence of you to a well, degree. Even Gracie's was a, was an artist who was compelled to do right. it, you know, and the concept there is exactly what you said, this desperation to hold on because the tragedy of a child dying is so big because, uh, in fact, I've come across a lot of like infant graves that have infants like, carved onto Mm -hmm. the 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 stone and it is it is it is a um we we need to keep the the soul you know the spirit the the love and so they make these representations of of these uh of these past children so losing losing a child is tough i'm not a mom but uh (laughs) from from what i've seen with other people like the loss of a child is like one of the worst losses you can go oh, through. Absolutely. And you do everything you can to try and hold on to that little bit, which is why there are some parents who, uh, like if their child dies, they do not touch that child's bedroom. That right. child's yeah. bedroom is, sacred, yeah. is, you know, a memorial well, to they them. They make mourning dolls. Yeah. Yep. You know, which is, which is fascinating. And not to underscore the, the therapeutic value of it, but it, it, it it scares me. You know, I, I, I myself get very like uneasy with the idea. First, a doll is kind of, you know, yeah. right on the line of being creepy no matter what. But then when you have a doll that is, you know, by feature and by even like wearing the clothes right. of the deceased child, that, that begins to, to give me a little, you know, uh, those are called the woogity woogities. Yeah. <laughs> woogity woogities are internal, woogity boogities are external. Yeah, mourning. Mourning is also just a weird process it, it because is. we is, all grief is go yeah. through our own process and our own coping skills. And yeah, what what works for you might be really weird to me. Right, <laughs> absolutely. And uh, yeah, and I would never, <laughs> I would never prescribe to anyone the, the the course of action. But I know that, uh, in particular, mourning dolls give me the. Well, <laughs> it's just personally for me, it's like a textural thing for them. Uh, they're really <laughs> gross feeling um, because we, we used to have one. And I feel like we probably still have it somewhere. But um, when we had an Alice Riley scene at the Savannah Underground, we gave her a mourning doll because it's an immersive scene. So you don't want the baby doll to look like super baby like, you know, like baby doll like, I should say. You want it to look more realistic. So we bought a mourning doll. That thing. If, if I get they're trying to like rep, replicate the pudginess of a baby. Oh, is it squishy? It's squishy. And oh, I no. don't like that. <laughs> and I'm squishy. just, yeah. And Ugh. I'm just like, Ugh. that's what creeps me out. Mm. I just also hate dolls, but you know, it's just a, a it's like a, ew, like your ew kind of thing when you touch them. But regardless, um, onto the other side of what I was going to actually say before <laughs> I thought about our morning doll, um, was that, 
even uh, during times where infant mortality was really high, people weren't even naming their kids until they got to a certain age yeah, to just show how like, you know, deeply people were worried about having to go through that process. They were oh, like, yeah. it's easier to lose a child that you never even really bonded with by, because you called them baby or right. son or daughter or whatever you called them. Um, so you can go in you know, Savannah in particular to a lot of the, the infant graves or young children graves. And it will just say baby, or it will say infant of mom and dad's mm -hmm. name, right? Things like that. So, um, you know, and I think it would just made it a little bit easier for people. Absolutely. They like yeah. started the mourning process because they just anticipated that it was very likely that it could happen. They started the mourning process like from the day of the child being born, which just says a lot about the uh, mental state that that era of people were in. Yeah. Yeah, the type of fortitude that was going on there. Yeah, <laughs> right. They were like, oh, well, you know. If, if the child makes it to two, we'll give it a name. <laughs> right, right. I think it was like four or five sometimes people would wait until they got to that age because they were like, yeah, their immune system's just good enough <laughs> that they might be able to fight off scarlet fever. Well, walking around Bonaventure or Laurel Grove, but you definitely see it a lot at Bonaventure, um, John Waltz, who also did Little Gracie's Headstone, mm -hmm. did several other children's graves, and another one is uh, two children. Uh, oh, yes. Like the five-year-old and then like an infant, infant. And they were sisters, but they were born and died at two different times. And the family waited until the second child had died to have this headstone created for both children. And you see that with several other headstones as well. They'll wait till like all the kids have passed, like they're, they're yeah. past 12, okay. The kids who died before these kids, now we'll now get them get, a headstone. Yeah, exactly. And so it's one headstone for like three children. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, you see that even with families in general in mm -hmm. cemeteries a lot. You'll just see like, especially for families that didn't have as much money, because if you didn't know, funerals are very expensive. And, and so are headstones. Right, and they've always been that way. So a lot of families couldn't afford, you know, for the entire family to get a headstone one day. So they were like, we're just going to buy one big one and we'll just keep adding right. to Absolutely. it, you know. And it was the same way on crypts and stuff too. You you know, you'll notice on some of the, they'll have like two like headstones built into the crypt. And it'll just have names of all the people who are inside the crypt. We're just dust people now, but you know, dust that's... <laughs> well... <laughs> It's kind of true. The you know, as opposed band. to dust bunnies. <laughs> yeah, they are not dust bunnies. You know, they are dust people. And because I've always loved the imagery of, you know, some. Imagine the job of being the person that has to go in there into those crypts with the new body, uh, the new family member, and they've got to be like, oh, you know, Dorothy, she's all bones now. Got to just wipe her off the slab. And so <laughs> it's to put her into the ossuary. It's like, I've always imagined that. I'm like, how horrible of a job. You're like, oh, God, like, you're, you're a mess. You're a lot of dust. <laughs> you're barely held together. Come on. Keep it together, girl. Yes, because that's essentially what they did was, you know, once that's how they made room for all those family members was they would have the, the slabs and stuff, and once the person was fully decomposed, they could just go into the ossuary, which is just a mixture of all the other relatives, a soup of relatives, oh, if God. you will. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Well, what's even weirder is the fact that there are inexplicable bodies that don't decompose at the right. same rate mm -hmm. or for some reason so could you imagine going down and they're like oh no well, this one's still occupied mm -hmm. <laughs> i don't think i can just put this one away it's looking pretty good for 100 years dead right uh, well and that's why they added the limestone a lot into crypts yeah. because um, limestone helps kind of accelerate the process a little bit um you know because you want it to like if especially if it's a smaller crypt, but you got a lot of family members, you're like, okay, you know. More bang for your buck. Right, right. And so um, that was really common, especially in Savannah. I always imagined, you know, how Sherman's Calvary, they would um, stay in Colonial Park Cemetery a lot and mm -hmm. they would sleep in the crypts. So I'm just like, just imagine how cold you had to been 
even though I'm like, y'all are from the north. So like, and yeah. it's the winter in should've Savannah. Been. It shouldn't have been that bad, but they would literally go into the crypts and sleep in them because they had slabs, that human sized slabs. It's like perfect. It's a bunk bed, you know? And that's, that's what they did. Yeah. So, if you ever come to Colonial Park Cemetery and you see these, they look like rooftops. They do. Um, know that there used to be stairs that went down mm-hmm. into these crypts. Uh, they're not just what you see because right. people are like how can you fit a family there no they're 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 much larger than they look uh we had to fill them in because you know i think as late as the 80s people were still able to like get down into them and people suck uh True. people would take things they would get things i think there's one story of a kid who like was running around the cemetery with a sword you know, and as one had, does. And he had broken into one of the things and took a sword from, from one of the bodies that was, you know, military uh, funeral and was running around with a sword. And I was like, well, there's several things wrong with this picture. <laughs> right. And those entryways also uh, fill up with water. There's still yeah. at least one out at Laurel Grove where you can still see the steps down. And yeah, if we have a heavy rain, that fills it up. Just fills right. Water, and yeah. yeah, mosquitoes. Right. And some murky, murky <laughs> dead bodies. Yes. Well, and I'm sure people were trying to sleep in them for shelter and things like that, which I would just like to say, don't do that. You know, maybe don't try to camp out in the crypts. Um, Bloody McKenzie's spirit. (laughs) His story started with um, a guy who was homeless in Edinburgh and he tried to sleep in the crypt and then he fell through to like this dungeon area of his mausoleum and whatnot. And that's what people like to say is what unleashed Bloody McKenzie was that. I don't like personally, I think it's because he's buried on top of a bunch of people he murdered, but you know, Uh, that. Details. He likes to take his work with him. Right. Right. I just, that's so ironic, is it not? That like, you know, out of all the cemeteries in Edinburgh in general, I'm like, they were like, you know what? It would be really funny (laughs) if if we took this awful man who made a concentration camp in this Kirkyard and we're just going to bury him right into the middle of it. That's, you know, that's, that's a. I wanted his spirit to have a little company. <laughs> that's that's a choice. That's a choice. <laughs> Didn't so. they also have to completely seal that one up? They did. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it's funny. Um, you can't. There's only one tour company that's allowed to uh, go to that mausoleum at night because the Kirkyard is open. If I remember correctly, the Kirkyard's open. Uh, at night, but that area you can't get over to because so many people have so many awful experiences with mm-hmm. Bloody McKenzie where they get injured, they've been like scratched and maimed and things like that. And um, the one tour company, the only reason why they have expressed permission is because they begged this, the city. They're like, please, can we take people here? It's a big part of the history of the, the city. And even them, or that company, they've had wild occurrences happen to them where, like, they had um, in their office, they had a fire that started out of nowhere. And at the same time that their office was on fire, the owner of the company's house was on fire during that same period. And there was no kind of, like, explanation of why it caught fire. So... Interesting. Don't mess with Bloody McKenzie, the very angry poultry guy. So. Don't mess with anyone whose nickname is Bloody. Bloody, yeah. Right. Once, once, you, once you get to the, you've, once you've earned the moniker Bloody. Right. Steer clear. Yeah. Steer clear. Which I think that was like JT and I's favorite ghost of 2022. We have referenced it so many times <laughs> because he's like one of those poultry guys that I'm just like, how are you that active? You know, but... Probably because he's got a big surge um, machine behind him. Um, oh, sure. So that, that makes perfect sense. So there you go. But um, yeah, that's probably my favorite ghost story. Oh, well, there 2022. we go. We've, yeah. well, what a, a smooth and seamless <laughs> right transition. Yes, and if you haven't listened to like my whole thorough uh, <laughs> breakdown of Bloody McKenzie, go way, 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 way back to. Um, the very early start of this podcast to uh, from one to wicked episode. And I did a thorough uh, research uh, on bloody McKenzie. So if you want to hear more about that, go there. <laughs> uh, but cause I'm not going to reiterate it for you here for the people who did listen to that episode. But Chris, what's your favorite ghost story? 
Well, if we're going just by the year of 2022, um, I spent the night in the Lizzie Borden house. Oh, yes. yes. And that had a numerous things. Probably one of the most interactive ghost hunts I've ever been on was at the Lizzie Borden house. But the story that stuck out and still kind of like is a thorn in my brain is that, um, so the Lizzie Borden house is actually uh, Lizzie Borden's father combined it was it was a single property where there are two houses and then he combined the two houses into one household and one built this house that there that is now the Lizzie Borden house what and it, it, this came up so casually and I was like why don't I know more about this so much so that I've I've seen a Lizzie Borden movie in the past uh, so I know that somewhere in my brain this story was there but for the life of me, whenever I think of Lizzie Borden, I never think of this. So Lizzie Borden, of course, uh, people who are familiar with Lizzie Borden, uh, an accused axe murderess who um, murdered her parents or her father and her stepmother. So um, that's enough. You know, that's that's pretty twisted. But what no one talks about is that a generation earlier, there was an Eliza Borden. Mm-hmm. And Eliza Borden threw her three children into the well under the house and then slit her own throat with a straight razor. This came up in trial because they were trying to suggest that th- there was something in the blood. There, there was a familial uh, you know, illness going on that caused women to murder. And uh, it turned out that she was not blood. She married into the family. And that was kind of how that, that whole argument... But it, it, it came and went and nobody talks about it. And I'm like, but What? Right. You know, on the property, a woman threw three children into a well. Two of them drowned. One of them survived, which is also horrifying to think about. And then she took her own life in one of the most graphic and terrifying ways, slitting her own throat with a straight razor. Bizarre. Not really being in tune with that story. Like, it kind of ambushed me. I was like, what? What? Why isn't that discussed more? Why don't they talk about that? Because in in a lot of ways in my mind, it's worse than, you know, the axe murder that happened. I mean, the axe murder is dramatic, I guess, and it's, it, but it's a mother killing her children and then herself. And at a time, of course, where, you know, postpartum depression was not even a consideration, like you know, a, a woman's feelings at all were not a consideration. Right. Uh, you know, Lizzie Borden actually was acquitted because they believed that a woman couldn't be as ferocious as that, you know, that a woman, well, a woman couldn't possibly oh, a little use lady. an axe. Yeah, a little lady, <laughs> let her go. She's just a little lady. Um, so is it just what, <laughs> they're in Massachusetts and we're like Southern lawyers <laughs> pulling out our Southern lawyer uh, accent. But um, the night I spent in there, they put us in this attic. Uh, that was the room we stayed in with a toy box full of toys. Ew. And um, <laughs> during the uh, the ghost investigation, there was this, um, and they were doing the Estes method. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Estes method, it's basically they take a person, they separate them from the group, and they put headphones on attached to a spirit box. And the spirit box is going up and down a radio, uh, and words are being you know aggregated from radio broadcasts or or voices are being heard, however you wanted to go. So the person doing the uh, the listening is sitting there and she she starts saying upstairs 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 over and over again which is odd because if you're listening to a radio why would any radio broadcast say upstairs repeatedly plus how would it happen over a scanning you know as you're scanning because you're listening to multiple radio stations so it's just one of those things so the guide the person who was leading the investigation was like oh you know what I know what this is you're asking about the attic the 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 uppermost attic room and it was like yes and it was like oh okay and um the, and so <laughs> me and my wife were like oh that's our room and um so then uh it said come play with us come play with us no. come play with us <laughs> and it was Megan. like and we're and we'll, well and we're just like uh yeah all right and it's like the man with the beard the bearded man the man with the beard and i was like That's me. I was like, come play with us. Come play with us. So I got up to go into the room where the woman is doing the essays because I figure that's what's being asked of me. I get up. I start walking. And she says, the other one, too. The other one. 
So Megan gets up and we go and we sit in the room and they're like, what shall we play? And we're like, oh no. <laughs> but it was a very intriguing because throughout that night, the, the spirit box was just going crazy. The things that I was saying, there was a point where it was like, you know, uh, it said like two redheads, two redheads. And, and our friends uh, are dating, but they're fiery redheads. It was like two redheads. And then it said, no, wait, three redheads. And Again, spirit box is going up and down, but this is what the the person's saying. So we're going through this, and and at at this point, someone in the room is like, "No, there's, there's there is only two redheads," and the husband of the woman who is listening to the box says, "My wife is a redhead. She dyed her hair black," and I was like, "Oh, that's weird." Yeah. <laughs> And it was fascinating. We were just fascinated by the whole evening. So, um, uh, and it sparked this interest. And uh, I'm I, I feeling before the end of the year, I'm going to spend the night at the Conjuring House uh, because uh, it's such a fascinating access to to points that are internationally renowned mm-hmm. and internationally celebrated. And now they're letting you stay the night in, in these it. places. So, uh, yeah, uh, I would say that just just the idea of having access to these haunted locations with kind of this open mindedness because forever, if you had a haunted location, you either kept a cap on it. You know, you, you were, you were like Savannah's one of the only towns that I really saw embrace its ghosts. And that's, you know, again, when we called um, this podcast, the most haunted city on earth, it was more about how we approach ghosts than it was the number or volume of ghosts. It was because I don't know of any other place that is or, or has been because I think that Savannah kind of led the way with this boom of ghost mm-hmm. tours, you know, uh, because before um, you might find one ghost tour like, you know, Salem, maybe New Orleans, you know, but now you can go to Columbus, mm-hmm. <laughs> Ohio. Right. You can you can find yourself in, in the middle of nowhere and there's a guy running his little ghost tour because every town, every city, every place has celebrated ghost stories, celebrated creepy stories, horrible crimes that they can, you know, manipulate into a storytelling adventure for people. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. So I will, I will say that for 2022, the Lizzie Borden experience was my favorite ghost story of the year. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's just a fun experience to have in general. So, I mean, I could totally agree that that should be your, your 2022 <laughs> per, uh, story. But the, um, yeah, it, it is so true, though, about Savannah that, like, we have always, as a city, really embraced our dark history like I've mentioned it before, but you know, even in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, where they have the scene where they go out to Bonaventure to drink their martinis and stuff, you know, uh, one of the characters says, like, to understand Savannah, you have to understand our dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's very accurate, you know, because we kind of treat our dead like they still are alive in a degree, you know. Well, yeah, and it it really tells you how the city maintained because it was the the woman with the painted face you know Mm -hmm. we cover our blemishes Mm -hmm. and so one of the ways we cover our blemishes is we tell these ghost stories of oftentimes horrendous action but in the end we've made it almost you know a genteel experience oh my my, my house is haunted is your house haunted? oh poor dear you don't have a ghost in your house oh no and people do in yes. Savannah mm-hmm. just Absolutely. like openly talk about it. Uh, last weekend, my spouse and I were downtown. He went over to the rail, which we did not realize was in the middle of SantaCon. Oh, and, oh. yeah. And I, I oh, can't that's deal genuinely scary. Yeah, yes. I can't deal with that many people in such a small space. So uh, I said, "You can stay here, hang out with your friends. I'm just going to go walk around." And I had ended up in. Uh, there's that area of City Market where they have art galleries oh, yeah. on either side oh, yeah. of right. St. Julian. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I had gone upstairs. I'm just walking around, just killing time. And the section that I walked into, almost all the galleries are closed except for one. And I didn't want to be rude because I knew they had seen me walk past. So I decided to, you know, duck in. And 
we start talking and I mentioned that I have my own ghost and history tour company and the owners just start telling me about all the experiences that they had had in that building. And I didn't ask. Right. They just offered. Oh, yeah. And people do that all around Savannah. They love to talk about their experiences, especially if they find out that you're willing to listen. Oh, and yes. that is very unique to Savannah. You do also get it in New Orleans as well. But in Columbus, Ohio, when... My sister and I did that tour. The uh, tour guide and another guy who was local to Columbus were talking about how hard it was to get people to talk about their ghost experiences because you get all these places who are like, oh, yeah, that building's definitely haunted. That building's definitely haunted. Oh, cool. Well, what's it haunted by? Oh, well, we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Well, and to the point, growing up, I never told my ghost stories until – I knew a person really well. The idea of telling strangers my ghost stories was always like, well, that's just going to brand me like a lunatic. Right, you know, you, exactly. You, you have to be guarded. And the fact that Savannah was so open to listening to ghost stories and sharing ghost stories was like, well, you know, I do have a lot of ghost stories. I do have a lot of experiences. But I was still very hesitant to tell any ghost story that was personal or any ghost story that was, you know, something I experienced. Um, and still to a certain degree, you know, I, I find myself hesitant to just dive into new people. Like you meet a person, it's like, mm, I gotta wait to see how they'll right. respond to this, you know, series of stories or 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 this this part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's it's the shameful you know, like corner of of secrets. It's like, oh yeah, no, no, I'm not a ghost hunter. I don't know what what are you talking about? No, I I I just like to ghost. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. It's it's interesting because Savannah it was. Um, you know, I was uh, friends with uh, like one of the pioneers of the ghost tours in in Savannah, um, and he was so flamboyantly open about ghosts, and and he was so happy about it, and um, and like I want to say that at the time, uh, it was Ghost Walk, Ghost Talk was the only ghost tour in town, and he was. He was just a joyous, you know, these are the ghosts. And he was very excited about it. And uh, and it was one of those eye-opening things. It's like, you can just go around and tell ghost stories. And, and, and A, you know that people love ghost stories, but you don't know how much they love your ghost stories. You know, mm -hmm. they, how much they're going to love this idea that, A, they're not alone. Because almost everyone, hands down, has one story that they can't wrap their head around mm -hmm. one event and and maybe it's just a familial event you know something that happened in in their circle of influence that really s s they struggle with and to hear somebody else validate it and to hear somebody else say you're not crazy you know you're not there's there's something very primal to the experience of ghosts you know uh and i would dare say you know from the from the death of the first human being there must have been a long-term effect you know, he was just alive and now he's not and and trying to govern that. You know, um, I oftentimes think about like pets of people who have passed and how those pets continuously look and continuously like try to find their owner. And it's like there's something to that experience that is universal that when somebody leaves, what's left behind is haunting, mm -hmm. literally haunting. Absolutely. The, um, uh, but I, I'm in the same boat as you of like, I did not tell people my ghost stories at all. And honestly, I still find myself, you know, if even my friends and stuff, I'm like, I don't really talk about my ghost <laughs> stuff, you know, <laughs> I'm like, cause I, you know, I don't want them to be like, Oh, is there a ghost around me all the time? Like Madison, like, why are you always like talking about the ghosts that you see your little, woo, you know, like, right. right. Um, so I, I, I find myself in that same boat, but it's true. It's Savannah in general, like people who come here, they just assume everybody is a ghosty person, but, <laughs> or it's just probably because I wear ghost stuff all the time. I wear ghost earrings and stuff and they see it and they're like, oh, it's December and she's wearing ghost earrings. Let me tell you my ghost story. <laughs> and so it's, uh, I found a lot of my stories that I've gathered because of those experiences of people just walking up to me or they take my tour. I love when locals take my tour because at the end of it, they're like, great. I have a excellent story to tell you. Or like this weird thing happened to me while I was at work. Like I, um, 
had a woman a couple months ago who worked at Pi Society come on my tour, and she, uh, she, we ended up finding out, it's the same woman, if you heard my story about the guy who told me about his haunted house, and then uh, two weeks later, oh, right. the, uh, the uh, Barnard Street thing. Yeah, the 34th and Barnard house. Um, yeah, and it was her house that we found out that that girl was murdered in and things like that. So if you don't know that story, go watch some previous episodes. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, after I had told her that somebody was murdered in her house and that's why she's having all the experiences she's having, she was like, huh, that makes sense. Also, you know, while I was at work, um, the other morning there was, um, I'm there at like 6 30 AM because I bake all the pies and usually it's just me and this other lady who works next door. And so I was outside taking out, um, some like trash or whatever. And I, um, saw her and I was like telling her like, Hey, I just put a fresh pot of coffee on. Do you want any coffee? And I, while I'm talking to her, I see this woman dart into the building and so immediately she's like, oh, that's weird. Like, why did someone run inside? It's literally like seven o'clock in the morning at this point. And she's like, well, maybe it's like a homeless woman or something. And maybe she's just looking for like food or coffee or whatever. So she goes inside and she, Pie Society, the little crown um, by Pie Society. If you haven't been to it, it is not a large building. No, no. There no, is no. not any room to hide. So basically she walks in and she doesn't see her. So she calls out. She's like, hey, is anybody in here? You know, like, um, like I just, you know, I saw you run in here. I want to make sure you're doing okay. And basically she, all she sees is the shadowy figure of a woman who's just standing there in the lobby and then when she sees her, she runs back down the hallway, back out to the alley. And she's like, that was the experience. And I was like, so she's like, so is there any like ghosts known for that area? And I'm like, well, I mean, Funny you should ask. I'm like, I mean, you're in city market. Like that's, you know, prime time ghost central, you know? And we, that's something that I always get because like uh, leading a ghost tour, you'll walk around and somebody will stop you on a ghost tour and say, you got any stories about this building? Oh my you God. Know, all and, the time. And you're like, uh, what's interesting is sometimes you have ghost stories, but they're just not stories. They're just right. like events and stuff. So I was once stopped on state street and somebody points at this building. He's like, yeah, ghost stories about this building. And I'm like, you know, I do, but it, I, there's nothing to tell. Um, you know, people used to see a man sitting on, you know, there's a, there was a wooden bench thing in there. I was like, yeah, I see a, a, a man sitting on the bench and the guy's like, yeah, you want to know who he was? And I was just like, yes. And the story that he told was that he used to work in this building um, they got that bench from like when a restaurant went out of or, uh, you know, it's kind of junk shoppy. So they, they got this bench, they pulled it in and it had this weird furrow in the back of the bench where you sit. And he said, you know, everybody working there started having like weird experiences, seeing like when they open before sun comes up, they'd see him. And, you know, there's a guy sitting on this bench and they go through all this stuff. Um, turns out that the furrow was a bullet that went through a man and and was still in the bench. Oh, Lord. Like, he he had dug the bullet out of the bench, and he was like, when we pulled the bullet out of the bench, the haunting stopped. People stopped seeing him. And I was just like, that's an amazing story. So the Pie Society that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. that's where I met these people mm -hmm. with the art gallery. So if you go through Pie Society, it goes into mm -hmm. this art gallery building that has multiple galleries. And there's a downstairs and an upstairs. And I've only been on that side twice, I think. I actually used to work, uh, our friend Casey Jones right. had, the had a gallery across the way. And so uh, I used to work there, but I knew of the one across the way. And so that's where I just ended up that day. I don't like the stairs in that building. And mm -hmm. I couldn't tell you why, but I did not like the stairs. I'll walk up and down the stairs on the other side all day long. Not a problem. Don't like the stairs on that side. So both times I've been there, I've taken the elevator. When I met those gallery owners, they told me that people get pushed down those stairs mm -hmm. all oh. the time. Yeah, uh, People who do not believe in ghosts uh, we'll just tumble down the stairs and they'll say, something pushed me. I felt it. I've heard that story so many times because um, the uh, Vinnie's, which mm -hmm. is right around the corner, mm -hmm. doesn't have a bathroom of their own. They actually send people into that corridor. And granted, this is usually people who are 
inebriated or drunk, right. they'll go into this because that's where the bathrooms are, but they'll find themselves on the staircase and they'll, they'll say that they've been pushed. They, you know, someone shoved me, you know, I'm like, Hmm. So take the <laughs> elevator. Take, take the, the elevator. elevator. <laughs> yeah. And if you see a, a random shadow lady running around the building, then maybe it's the same one, yeah. you know, but she might be the pusher or the pushy. Right. She may have been pushed down those stairs. Well, so like the lady who I talked to, you know, she, um, She's like, I, I wasn't scared of her. I was just more confused. So I was like, what are you, wh- what, what is going on? You know, because <laughs> she genuinely thought she was going to just like give this like homeless lady, you know, a cup of coffee because she's like, that happens sometimes, you know, sure. they come by and she's like, oh, you know, I just give them something and they go on their way. But she was like, it's just weird that like she chose to stand there. And then she was like, OK, bye. You know, yeah, she's zoom. she's like. Why did you come in in the first place if you didn't want any kind of interaction? You know, and I was like, well, probably because she thought that you were leaving. And she's like, great. Right. You know, now it's, it's time like, to go <laughs> right. rest. Right. Maybe she should leave out a cup of coffee for her. Right. Oh, that'd be cute. You know. Well, and yeah, the city market has so many stories of, you know, a brothel. Oh, yeah. A fire. What well, hasn't been a know. brothel in Savannah? Well, my favorite was <laughs> right on the corner of... Um, of City Market, if you go, I think it's an anthropology now, but it used to be the 606 Cafe. Mm. And and famously, that place was haunted by a prostitute. That yeah, At least everybody said that. And I was like, well, if she's not a prostitute, she's going to be real mad <laughs> that that's how she's remembered. She's like, are you kidding me? I was like, what? <laughs> well, one of my friends used I to- I am a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> one of my friends used to work for the Georgia Historical Society. Oh, yeah. And in her spare time, she liked to just research random things about- Savannah, and unfortunately she moved a few years ago, but one thing that she was working on was researching Savannah's red light districts mm-hmm. because they did move around the they city. Did, right. Uh, where the old jail and the old police department are. Uh, that area across from there, that whole area used to be a red light district. One oh, yeah. of the inns over there Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. advertises like, yeah, we used to be a brothel. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. But there used to be multiple mm-hmm. in the area. Well, yeah, when you get to that east side, it was a pretty undesirable side of Savannah. You know, they actually had a wall that was like, this is real Savannah. You're a fake Savannah. Get out. <laughs> shoo, shoo. And right. so, yeah, yeah, it's interesting because the red light district did move and almost always it was a, an event, like a fire or, you know, uh, a, a big change in the fortunes of an area because that, that <laughs> it's fascinating because I guess wherever there's money, the brothel is going to be. Right. But with a reversal, either way, if the money goes up, the brothel's forced out. If the money goes down, the brothel has to leave. Mm. Yeah. I mean, like, it makes sense, though, that they think there's a... a- prostitute ghosts at anthropology because in that jefferson street mm-hmm. or yeah jefferson mm-hmm. street historically is known where a lot of the prostitutes would be i mean that's so it makes sense that they'd be over there oh, no, it's so that it's, whole block right you know, because there was a time when it was in city market proper and then that row of buildings that is where anthropology all the way down to um the grove i think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. was it was like pick your building any of these buildings and it was you know the business was on the the ground level, the businesses of whatever, the legitimate businesses, and then you go upstairs to, you know, the brothels. Mm-hmm. They How many so, times can we say brothel in a podcast? Right. <laughs> it's like, we put a brothel counter yeah. on, you know. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> 17 times. But, I mean, they also, um, at the escape company, right mm. below mm-hmm. Anthropology, they also have a couple... Um, prostitute ghosts is what they believe because and john ghost mm-hmm. right? john ghost yeah. yeah they they call him like the trench coat yeah, guy, the trench or, guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah because they still see him pretty often um Kristen, who was on the podcast a while ago who's our stage manager she also works at the escape company and she said that was like one of the first um ghosts that she saw working there was the trench coat john because he was back in the um where is it? The uh, control room. So for escape rooms, they have a control room where they can watch the guests. And, you know, if they're, you know, not doing well, they can chime in on the radio and tell them how to do better. And so guests aren't supposed to be back there. And she saw this guy in a trench coat go to the back uh, control room. And she was like, oh, that's not right. You should not be back there. And her 
coworker also saw him go back there. But when they went back there, no, no John. So, you know, they're kind of tr- passive ghosts in a way. They're not sure. very active usually. I've noticed that a lot with our prostitute and John ghosts in Savannah. They're usually nothing more than you hearing the high heel clicks or you just see them in passing. Right. But Do you think it's just residual response? energy? That's kind of what I personally think because I've, I've never heard anybody actually have an interaction with one, but you so, never know. So. where the anthropology is, when it was the six or six multiple people, there used to be a long, big mirror right outside of the bathrooms. And people would walk down the hall and see in the mirror a woman standing. But when they turned, and, you know, it's not a big hallway. So they're coming around the corner and they see a woman there. And so they're trying to avoid her, but she's not there. She's only in the mirror. Mm. And, um, and they always say the same thing. She's staring into the mirror. Uh, That's which creepy. Which then becomes she's staring out of the mirror. You know, she's just dead stare. And and they typify that she's wearing, like, old-timey clothes, but that's not unusual for downtown Savannah because all, all the way back to the 90s, people started doing tours in costume, in, right. you know, in period clothing. So a lot of people thought, and plus at the time, the waitresses of 606 were wearing a very atypical clothing. You know, it was just, they, they all wore strange i think they all wore tutus basically so they're they're wearing strange clothing so to come around the corner and see somebody that's not necessarily dressed like everyone else was not a a weird thing but um i do remember that the guy who bought the mirror he put it in his house and then his house got on fire oh my god (laughs) and the story the, the again these were years in the in the making stories um it would come out that the story that people believed happened in that brothel was that a man beat a prostitute to death with a lantern like Uh took the lantern and beat her to death and it set the room on fire which was a fire that that burned down a good portion of the city market area wow yeah that's a aggressive it's aggressive spirit i mean you know mirror ghosts are also just weird yeah Yeah. (laughs) we can't get into it again or you know the internet will roast us you'll scare tiktok again oh lord somebody wrote an article about it in the really yeah i was so i regularly you know like google the podcast and things like that so that you know i can keep up to date with things that um and i came across this really just like no name kind of blog, but you know, sure. somebody had wrote uh, written an article and it came up with your name and my name. And I was like, that's weird. Okay. Let me read the article. And they were talking about TikTok, and he like basically in depth summarizes that TikTok, and you know, and then he said, and then there's some people who truly full heartedly believe in these people, but then there's other skeptics like myself who think that it's false. And that's what the article says. That's it. I'm like, so you took your time to write, write this opinion entire, blog, yeah. but you didn't give your opinion. I'm just like, so makes you sound like you're like mirror ghost televangelist. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's just it. I, I, I have no interest in changing anyone's belief structure. <laughs> right. Well, I just think it's funny because I'm just like. You know, I, I'm totally for people having, like, a, a debate, you know, and things like that of, like, if you don't want to believe in and you have, like, your strong opinions of, like, this is why I don't think you're correct, I'm, like, full-heartedly give me that article because I'm actually interested to hear the other side, but I'm just, like, you took your time to write this thorough, like, very thorough. They're, like, Susie and Timmons are out here making bold claims of mirrors. And I'm just like, oh, goodness gracious. But I'm like, give me the opinion. Give me the punch at the end, at least, you know? Well, because skeptic is not a stance. Right. It's just not. I'm skeptical. Great. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm skeptical that, you know, calamari is a good thing. (laughs) It's like, I have my, my skepticism. (laughs) About that, <laughs> and 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 uh, put it's that like, on your business card. Right. It's, calamari it's, yeah. skeptic. <laughs> calamari skeptic. You know, and it's like, well, some people think it's great. You know, well, those people are idiots. You know, that's right. not how it works. <laughs> right. You know, it, it does not come down to that. You know, these are the, whenever you talk about ghosts, you're really just talking about a an idea that we ruminate on. Right. <laughs> you know, and so anybody who takes a sense or a, a position of authority one way or the other is not really looking at the issue. It's <laughs> not really right. thinking about why do we still tell ghost stories? What, what is the point 
of telling a ghost story or believing in ghosts or following ghosts or hunting ghosts or anything like that. These are ruminations on being alive, not the explanation of the unknown because we're not going to explain it. It's not going to happen. Not in our lifetime. Right. I don't think. Well, and it's... I mean, here's hoping. (laughs) Right, exactly. And I think it's fun, too, to discuss theory because, you know, like, there are so many books and things like that. Like, it's hard for one person to know everything in the world about something that is not concrete. So, you know... Absolutely. It's it's fun to discuss and banter and things like that. And I think that was really the core of this podcast, you know, is, like, we just enjoy speculating about all the different things that could be If these microphones weren't here... We'd be doing this. Right. We'd, we'd, yeah, we'd be right. sitting around talking this and, and having these same kinds of observations and ideas because it's just something that we've grown accustomed to thinking about. And, and yeah, it does form opinions. It does f- form these ideas that we, you know, for lack of a better word, believe in. The word belief is, 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 is a, in quotations, because I think we're all still searching. Like, there are things we know mm-hmm. internally and, and have a good understanding of, but they're all based on experience and on observation. They're not, no one's out there writing the definitive right, you know, right. treatise on it. Yes. So, you know, take, take, you know, ghostly and spiritual things with a grain of salt and just like notice when it comes up a lot or, you know, yeah. if you're reading things and you're like, oh, this same person says the same thing or this, 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 right. it gives it a little bit more validity, you know, when multiple people have observed the same, you know, behavior from spirits or and things like that. And never discount personal experiences. Exactly. You know, I have terrible personal experiences with certain things that make me, you know, shy away from it. And it is not because I understand it. It's actually because I don't. <laughs> it's, right. It's not because, oh, I know that's evil. It's because I don't have a firm grasp on all of the pieces here. And I've seen it do damage. I've seen it do harm. I've seen people harmed by it. So, yeah. And what works for one person may not work for another. Absolutely. All right. three of us could go into a haunted location, and all three of us could have three very separate incidents. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's another thing is, yeah, individually – we are geared by everything that has come before to have a, a filter in front of us, the filter of what we know, what we don't know, filter of what we've experienced and haven't experienced. And that will guide us into different experiences. You know, um, Madison is far more adept at interacting with spirits, whereas I am hyper conscious, hyper vigilant, uh, because I'm scared. You know, <laughs> the bottom line is I get. I get scared easily. And so I'm using a different Lens. metric yep. <laughs> to, to, to uh, navigate any haunted situation. And a lot of that is just the, the concept of preservation for me, whereas it's the concept of exploration for Madison. And I feel that's the same with yep. Annie, is, is this explorative notion. Um, I am wary. You know, I spend most of my time being very, you know, wary of of the entire situation so we do need to wrap things up but i will leave the episode at this um because something that we got a request for uh when we asked people to send us what they'd like to see on the podcast somebody somebody wanted the ghost of the day all right now okay I'm going to tell you this uh, because the request was very specific of um wanting to because they find my experience with the paranormal very interesting because I have a very different experience with them they were like try to communicate with these spirits and see why they're there I will tell you if that happens I will let you know immediately but very rarely do the spirits that I see on a day-to-day basis have any desire to communicate they're kind of just there so just wanted to make that uh, a little bit more clear of, I don't think I've specified that, you know, some of these experiences are very just quick and like, I'm like, oh, they're there. Cool. You know, it's not always like me talking to them and figuring out their names or, you know, being like, so what brings you here, John? You know, it's like things like that. But my ghost of the day. So um, a couple weeks ago when we had Jessica Schroyer on the show, really weird occurrence that um, during the podcast, while we were filming, I was very distracted the whole time because standing behind 
uh, Chris and I's camera over uh, towards the curtain of the theater, there was a man with a bowler hat and a big mustache, a big handlebar mustache, standing there just staring at us the whole time. And I kept hearing in my head, I... I should say, before people think I'm, I'm schizophrenic or crazy, um, that I have, it's, I have my voice of my own inner thoughts, and then there are other voices that pop in sometimes that are very much so associated with spirits, because I never hear them again. So this one, haven't heard this one before, and it kept saying, at well, at well, at well, at well, in my head, and I was like, can you, can you stop? And also, typically, when a spirit is trying to contact me, I, or trying to, give me some type of information, I get a ringing in my ear. Now, if it's my spirit guides, it's ringing in this ear. If it's it's just a normal spirit, it's ringing in this ear. So it was doing that. And I'm trying to listen to Jessica, you know, trying to be a good host here. And I just have this intense ringing in my ear. And then at well, at well, at well, going off in my head. We later at uh, towards the end of the episode, we found out her maiden name, which uh, can you remind me of what the maiden name was? Because we had a conclusion here. I mm, I should know this. Uh, it started with D. It was um, Duncan. No, no, no. no. It's a com- It's a it's a pretty prominent name in Savannah. Right. <sighs> nope, it's gone. Well, regardless, <laughs> um, go back and watch Jessica's episodes, and you'll find out the actual name. I don't know why I can't remember her maiden name, but regardless, it um, Dutch? no, no, it was. Yeah. Oh gosh. Anyway, we'll find it. Yeah. Find so, point being, though, uh, it was a, like Chris said, a very common um, Savannah maiden name or Savannah family name. And I told Chris about this experience after Jessica left, and he goes, "Do you think that's because her family would have been a prominent family in Atwell? What we've found about Atwell being is uh, they're also a prominent Georgia family in general because they had the Atwell." Pecans, Pecans yeah. and um, they now have a store in Savannah called Atwell's uh, Framings and whatnot. Uh, so we're like, do you think that he heard that she was a blank family name? And he was like, oh, I, or he knew that she was a part of that lineage. And he, that's why he decided to finally show up because we've been picking up on pieces of this Atwell trail. Right. For, for those of you who don't know, right. uh, Atwell actually came through the spirit box um, the first time we fired it up in this right. location. And what was strange was it came up repeatedly. It wasn't just like one Atwell. It was repeatedly Atwell in two different um, uh, machines, mm-hmm. which was very peculiar because one machine is not uh, scanning the radio waves. Uh, and, and it came through. It was just like, uh, that's, that's weird. really odd. And it's very strange to, to hear that repeatedly and that yeah set us on a (laughs) on a little bit of a um a breadcrumb trail you know it's um but yeah basically though I had never seen the spirit before and I've obviously never seen this man with um you know the bowler Bowler hat hat. and the handlebar mustache I would have noticed that um and I thought it was weird that he I know that was the last time I've seen him is that time when jessica was here so yeah, jessica, jessica back. Yeah. yeah i know jessica she listens to the podcast so jessica while you're driving uh just make a mental note like that we need to get together and bring you back in here so we can see if that's why that happened but that's your ghost of the day y'all so <laughs> long story but interesting story at least so uh thank you guys so much for listening though uh and making it all the way to season three hopefully you had a great holiday season and your new year is going to be great 2023 we're sending you lots of hope and joy and ghostly encounters so uh (laughs) with that though uh any do you have anything else that you want to plug before we uh sign off no I don't have anything. <laughs> okay. Well, take Eni's tour um, and follow and watch her. watch my TikToks. Yes. It. No. <laughs> watch her TikTok. She works very hard Seek on those. Seek out the TikToks. Right. Uh, but with that, though, uh, if you don't already follow us on social media, what are you doing at this point? You've made it this long without doing it. So uh, you can find us on all social media platforms under Haunted City Podcast. You can also find us on our website uh, at hauntedcitypodcast.com where we have the blog posts, we have merch, we have lots of fun things going on over there. So uh, with that, my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie, And stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>